Good evening, everyone. My name is Graham White. I work for the RSPB as part of the Ecology Department. And my talk tonight is entitled, Have I Got Poos For You? Um, first of all, a couple of apologies then. First of all, state of my hair, but I guess we're all in that situation. And, and secondly, the talk tonight has quite a lot of poo gags in it. And that's mainly because it was originally written for, um, let's say, a much younger audience. So I'm afraid you'll have to put up with that. But what's it about? Well, in the cupboard behind me here, I have like a lot of naturalists, a whole collection of bits and pieces, but my prize possession is a large poo collection, which I've collected throughout my career. And this talk really is the, is the story of my poo collection. So why is it important? Well, um, if you're in the African bush and you find a load of rhinoceros poo, it's really important if you're an ecologist, if you know if you're just about to be trampled by a black rhino or white rhino. Um, and of course, that's quite easy. Just pick it up quickly, rip it open, scratch and sniff and you will know. And it's quite clear, of course, that if you scratch it and it's it's rough and acidic and uh, not very nice, it's uh, it's a black rhino browsing on shrubs. And if it's if it's much smoother and sweet, sweet smelling and herby, well, it's it's the it's the grazing white rhino. So there you are, it's quite simple. And you never know when a poo specialist has been, will be called for. And I've been called to identify poo many times in my career. Now, if you go back a little bit, if there was an escaped wombat, I would have been one of the few people who'd know how to track an escaped wombat by its cubicle poo. But nowadays, I think there's been a few uh, articles in papers going on about wombat poo. So. I guess everybody knows. But anyway, um, let's start at the beginning. How did I get involved in poo collecting? Um, the very beginning was I was at the Wildlife Trust and we were starting a project looking at otters or starting to think about reintroducing otters to Hertfordshire. And at that stage, I was advising a gravel company on the design of a, of a new um, nature reserve within a wildlife site and as well as many other things they were interested in reintroducing otters to Hertfordshire. I wasn't particularly keen on this project at the time but uh, I went along with it and the Otter Trust were involved and otters were reintroduced and of course one of the key things after they were released from the the pen was keeping track of them and, and uh, we built along the valley as well a number of otter holts, artificial otter holts. You can see one in construction there, the pipes uh, along the valley, and we would check all these sites. And of course, to find out where the otters were spreading to throughout the valley from our release site, we were looking for signs. And that would be either the poo, the sprint. Uh, and of course, one of the key things about uh, poo of us ecologists is different species we call them different names so in otters it, as you all know it's it's sprint so we were looking for sprints along the valley in key sites and we were also looking for footprints and and again in my cupboard here behind me i probably have a large collection of plaster of paris footprint um, which which i use as a reference collection but that's where it started so we started collecting 
sprint, looking for the otters, mapping the distribution of otters as they spread out from the release site. And of course, then having got otter sprints in, in pots, you start thinking, hmm, what are they, what are they eating? So that very quickly moved on to dissection of sprints, cleaning it out, identifying fish species, etc., and understanding a lot more about the diet of the otters as they were spreading up and down the valley. I continue to record otters on the, the sprints in the same sites right to the present day. Um, and there's been a number of surveys over the years. We're looking at the uh, the percentage occupancy of a number of different sprinting sites that we monitor. And, and no walk out locally for me is, is complete without staggering under a bridge or somewhere and just poking around looking for signs of otters, which is usually the sprint. What we know now is through doing all of this, of course, is that otters are well established in the valley. They're found in the majority of our monitoring positions. Um, and and they're breeding very well and have spread out. Well, at the Wildlife Trust as well, one of the other uh, key mammals we were working on was water voles. And again, we were looking for the distribution of water vole in the county. So again, signs, whether it be la the latrines or feeding remains were key. Um, we would run training courses for volunteers to look out and monitor these different areas. So it became recording all of these uh, uh, signs, poos became a standard part of the work really. And of course, if you're talking about water voles, you will inevitably be looking for signs of mink as well, one of the key predators. And you'd look for these uh, smelly, tarry, long, twisted, typical mustelid signs um, on, on key places to recall the presence of mink. And then latterly, we were, of course, trapping out mink in key sites uh, for the benefit of water vole conservation. After I left the Wildlife Trust, I moved on to the RSPB 20 odd years ago now. And one of the very first jobs they sent me on as I was, uh, had some experience of, of water voles and minks was up to Abernethy where they hadn't recorded water voles for quite a long while. They knew they had a lot of mink signs. And the warden there at the time said that if I managed to find any water voles on Abernethy, he'd eat his hat. I spent a week up there and although I didn't find any water voles down in the lowland areas along the Spey, up on the tops of the Cairngorms, on the peat hags, we discovered water voles living on the top there. Um, and this was at the time was was unknown and subsequently Desmond had to go on radio and eat his hat live, which was unfortunate for him. From doing that, I, of course, I was at the RSPB. So at that time we were obsessed with bitterns and, and we were creating new reed beds for the benefit of bitterns. And I was going into these reed beds and undertaking audits of the reed bed to check how good they were. And we were looking at, at certain times for bitter nests and recording the precise details. And you can see a nest there in the right hand picture. But equally, while we were wading through a lot of these reed beds, we were coming across large numbers of water voles. And these were in very deep reed beds. There was no uh, ground um, above the water level, but the, the water voles were uh, found in what we might call water vole hotels. They were bundles of grass that created with little ramps. But they, again, you would find the traditional uh, latrines and you would find the feeding signs in these areas. And it was, it was really interesting to see the density of water voles within many of these new reed beds that we were creating, uh, specifically for bittern, I guess, but benefiting a whole range of other species. And then perhaps on to the, the issue that I probably spent most time on looking at uh, um, remains and that's predation studies. And uh, it, a lot of times we're looking at some, some of our key species are breeding waders or ground nesting birds of various sorts and understanding what the key issues are and predation is one of those. And fox, you can see in the picture on the right there, we know now is, is absolutely a key predator of these things. Uh, I've just thrown in that picture on, on the left. 
um, that's a bit of an odd one. That's that's actually a picture from um, Belarus. That's an eagle owl pellet on top of a bittern skeleton. Um, and that in, in that area, eagle owls are one of the predators that come across. And I've done, I've done quite a bit of work with owl pellets as well, which are interesting, including um, looking at a lot of eagle owl pellets in this country from some upland areas, which is quite fascinating to see what, what they are eating. So in predation studies, and, and right up to the present time when I'm wandering around reserves that have breeding waders on, I'm always looking for signs of key predators. And the fox is, is the key one. And whenever you go through a gateway, you're looking in the mud for footprints, or you're looking around the edges of, of fences for uh, signs of scats, of, of mink, of uh, fox, so you understand a little bit about the density of predators on a particular side. And we would initially set up transects recording the number of, of scats on a site so that we could have that evidence of density of foxes and understand what the predation pressure would be. And of course the fox scat is, it, it, it should be very well known to any naturalist. You, you find these greyish black to whitish uh, scats often broken in, in, into two or three pieces with a pointy end and of course when you look at them the, the, the contents can be quite obvious. Usually it will be fur from small mammals but it may be bird remains as well. But when we're walking across a lot of these uh, grasslands on reserves the other things you might come across would be badger remains, badger uh, latrines where you've got the slightly sloppy badger poo in its in its latrine site or you might we might be looking for badger hairs or badger footprints across these sites just to understand if if these animals on them these are generally not such a, a major problem out on our sites but interesting to know that uh, they are present and then there will also be this the smaller mustelids as well such as stoat which can in in some situations take eggs or small birds but not generally be a a major predator that we would be concerned about and you'd find again the typical mustelid long spindly smelly tarry uh, scat if you look around the uh, the site so increasing knowledge of all of these uh, whether it be the the, the poos or the footprints just when you're walking around a site as, as an ecologist, just adds so much more information um, into your knowledge. And I, you know, here's an, a sample from last winter where a, a river bank, the river's flooded over a bank, you've got a nice sandy substrate and you can just look at it and its footprints on it from the previous night. And you can just see what's going on on that particular site. So an otter has come out and has pl plodded across the sand. Uh, a badger has walked on there. And there's been mink as well, all in one night and somewhere on there, I think there was some munjack footprints as well. So it just gives you an idea. Um, and sometimes I've gone to, to a site and I've gone back after I had a wander out and I say to them, oh, I've recorded 12 species of mammals or something. And they go, what? How have you done that? Well, it's it's all been footprints or poo. It just gives you a, this extra dimension of, of knowledge of what's happening on a particular site. Going away slightly from poo now, I also, you know, you'd also collect a whole range of other things. So I collect skulls. So again, linking to predation. If I find a predated egg, I would look for if it's if it's been eaten by a mammal, I will look for the marks where it's been bitten into. Um, and one of the things you can do with skulls is measure the distance between uh, the incisor, the, the canine teeth, um, and and measure that distance on the egg between the, the puncture holes and try and work out what's been eating them. So there's a couple of eggs in these pictures here. On the top right, there's a crane egg. Um, that one had been predated by an otter. Um, and on the left-hand side, there's a black-tailed godwit egg and that's been predated probably by a fox. So a range of other trips I've done as, as part of the RSPB has been to going to different sites and looking at what's going on. And a couple of years ago, I went up to Orkney. Um, I was specifically going up there to look at curlews, but um, it was an opportunity to collect some sample of Orkney vole poo. Um, and you think, oh, that's a, bit, that's a bit random. But even there, we are undertaking transects and recording the amount of uh, vole latrines 
across the moorland to get uh, an idea of the density of vole populations because that again is important in the habitat quality and it's a key food item for other species so knowledge of what those vole populations doing is very important but the key thing i went to look at was curlews which are in decline at the moment and and we were trying to understand why the nesting uh, success was very poor. Many of these curlews were, were losing their nests at the egg stage and we were finding eggs that had been eaten. Um, an interesting thing about Orkney is that there are no foxes there and I said earlier on that's the sort of key predator so we had to look for other culprits and a few come up and it's quite interesting. So um, actually my face is now hiding one of those which is a hedgehog and then down below there, we've got feral cats, which has an awful lot in Orkney. And then down on bottom left, there's a, a picture from a trail camera. And you might just be able to see within that um, a wing of a curly on the left hand side. And in the sort of center right, there's a stoat. So you, we, had, we identified three mammalian possible predators. And unfortunately for Orkney, all of these three were introduced mammals that now may be causing a problem for ground nesting birds. I also have looked at various tern colonies and here's some pictures from Coquette Island. So I went out to Coquette two years ago now where there was an issue with an otter on the island and we were looking at what it was feeding on and what we could do obviously to protect the very important colony of roseate terns there. Um, we found that uh, there was a key feeding area for the otter, um, but that its main food was puffins. And it, and it had eaten something like, I think we'd worked out it had eaten something like 200 puffins, but it wasn't, didn't appear to be eating any uh, roseate terns. And the puffin, the puffin uh, colony there is, is huge, thousands strong. Um, and uh, we thought the, at the end of the season that the otter would depart, which it did. But, but to just to check and make sure that in the future the roseate terns were going to be okay, we had to come up with a solution. So the solution there, as in, as in many other sites where we have these issues, was a predator exclusion fence. A, on, on this, in this case, a low electrified fence around the tern colony that kept the otters out. And this works extremely successful. And, and this might be the solution that we come up with in many sites. One of the, the famous and most embarrassing moments for me was on um, Country, no, not Country Far, it's that other program, Spring Watch. That's it, Spring Watch, many, uh, a few years back. And if you remember, um, there was a Spring Watch at Minsmere where unfortunately Audrey the Avocet had her chicks eaten by Boris the Badger. Um, what they didn't actually show on, on the TV programme that after Boris had eaten Audrey's chicks, he went on to munch up 22 broods of black-headed gulls on an island. Um, and for us, this was extremely embarrassing that we had Boris around there. So by the following spring watch, um, we had constructed a new predator exclusion fence around the scrape at Minsmere. Um, and as well, we had teamed up with some mammal ecologists to actually capture some of the badgers and put trackers on them. Uh, and the centre picture there shows in the different colours, the different badgers and their, their movements around Minsmere. Um, and we could see that the, uh, the scrape area which was sort of, you can just see it outlined where there's uh, no uh, badger marks, managed to keep the badgers out perfectly. There's one or two look as if they're inside, but they're just uh, uh, slightly wrongly located. What we did actually find from trail cameras is that, uh, that Boris came along and you can see his movements along the edge of the fence. He continually tried to get into there, couldn't get in, but then went off and foraged elsewhere on the site um, and Audrey, luckily that year, managed to fledge some chicks. So fences will actually work if they're well sighted and well maintained. Lots of other things that we get involved that have a poo element to them. So in many of our woodland sites, we will undertake deer impact assessments. And that again will be transects looking at browse and looking at uh, 
looking for latrines uh, of, of deer where the deer the deer poos when they clump together are called crotties which is quite interesting but that's a, again a key element to look at the impact of of deer on woodland reserves um, and again you can from the, the different footprints or the the crotties you can look at what species you've got and what the problems are and it may be in in some areas muntjac of a problem or in other deer seeker deer for example even more fascinating when you start to get into looking at these uh, poos and footprints in detail is that you can actually start to work out something about the sex and condition of the individual animals um, i'm not brilliant at this but but some people have a lot more experience say for example with red deer you can just looking at the signs you can work out whether it's a stag or a hind, you can work out a bit about its age and you can work out a bit about its condition. Now, some of this is, is quite tricky stuff, but uh, I've quite tried quite a bit of this and it's, it's really quite fascinating and adds a lot more interest to your, to your wanders through uh, different areas, seeing what you can find. Now then, the holy grail for poo collectors is the Capercaillie clocker poo. Now, uh, clockapoos, what is a clockapoo? A clockapoo is, uh, is a particular type of poo that is produced by grouse. Now, when a grouse, a female grouse is incubating on the nest, she does not go for a poo. She sits there and incubates throughout that whole period. Uh, and this is a protection against being detected by predators. But when she has finished incubation, and the uh, the eggs hatch she gets off the nest and does an almighty poo and and this is a clocker poo now if you go onto the moors in in the summer after the red grouse of, of hatching their young you will find red grouse clocker poos all over the place but the capercaillie very low numbers now and to find a female capercaillie clocker poo is it now there's a picture of there's there's the one that I found up in Abernethy and this this was a glorious moment and this is one of my key poos that uh, I have and if, if you are usually the course this is a live presentation and I would pass it around for scratch and sniff and admire uh, but you'll just have to uh, enjoy the photograph I'm afraid at this time I'm going to finish off just by um, trying to get a, a sort of a little bit more up to date and, and just talk about rewilding and poos uh, and looking at some of the species that uh, uh, we might have we are being introduced or we might have in the future and I, it's been uh, I've spent quite a bit of time looking at some of these first of all um, this is a picture now from many years ago when I was um, in Scotland um, and looking at our uh, lock of Kinaldi reserve and I came across this particular uh, site and of course this was um, beaver damage or damage it's beaver signs where they've been chewing the, uh, the, uh, the trees there and very quickly from there I found some some beaver poo uh, and this was the first recorded beaver sign on this particular reserve and, and of great excitement uh, and I found uh, beaver signs now on a number of our reserves they're spread around they are uh, rather more numerous than perhaps we, we might think <coughs> excuse me um and and actually to find a beaver poo you normally have to jump in the water below um uh the dams into the pools of water and, and fish them out from from those particular areas a couple of years ago, I went I went across to Poland and Belarus uh, to look at a number of other species. And one of the species I particularly was interested in was the European bison, the wissant. And uh, I spent a glorious day or two with a ranger who'd, who'd been working I think, 25 years in the forest uh, there, tracking bison with him. And it, it, again, it was fascinating. And we were just looking at what they were doing and looking at the uh we were there in the in the spring and the bison there were out in some of the meadows by uh in the in the evenings and browsing there and creating wallows and having summer poos which are sloppy 
uh, full of uh, sweet herby materials, a bit like a cow poo, a pat. Uh, and then the, the animals would go into the forest um, and, and hide up. And the, the ranger was explaining the winter pattern of behavior with these, uh, these bison where they would change their diet more to bark and to acorns and, and uh, the winter poos would be rather different. And we'd look for the whole range of different signs. And a, a fascinating thing. And then it was finishing at dawn with this uh, glorious beast looking at us from a, uh, a meadow. And while we were looking through these, uh, through the forest there, we would find a whole range of other signs. So here, this is, this is a fascinating one. There's a forestry track here and there's a poo on it. And uh, we were looking at these and here it is. This was, we were finding quite a lot of signs of wolf. And the fascinating thing here is it's quite difficult to see, but in the, in the photograph in the top right, there's a wolf poo, which is positioned within a red deer footprint. And we were working out that uh, we could follow the red deer for its footprints and we could see that the wolf was tracking the red deer and following it as it went through the forest. Uh, and just learning these bits and pieces, I think, you know, and seeing what's happening in different areas from signs without actually seeing the animal uh, is fascinating. The wolf picture there uh, wasn't one that we saw, it was from one of the trail cameras that the ranger had set up. So, we are coming to a summary and here's a sort of reminder, a reminder of who done it. And I'm sure you'll know many of these, but down the line from the, from the top, if we're looking for poos, tubular, large, often smelly, pointed ends, carnivores, very distinctive. We, um, they become smaller and thin and twisted. We're looking at the whole range of mustelids. We've got the pancake types, cow, bison, etc. The blocks of uh, the deer poo, which slot together very nicely into great big clotties. And then we've got the pea-like poos of rabbits and hares. And then a whole range of the tinier poos of vice, um, voles and mice. So when I usually do this um, live, this, this talk, I give the kids a little quiz at the end who's poo i'm quite sure how we're going to do this now i just have to um, let you think about it for a moment and guess this one so here we are there's a a few little drops there you know they they look quite coarse in texture maybe are they big or are they small i don't know well what might it be could be rabbit or no it's hair well in fact actually it's an irish hair um, and this was this was from Northern Ireland when we were looking at hair populations on some of our reserves and again looking at the uh, the density of the droppings across the site. What about this one then? You should all know this one. So here we are. We're walking across the lawn in the morning and here's this uh, couple of inch long dropping and you have a look at it and you can see it's full of invertebrate rem remains some beetle elytra and other bits and pieces in there that's a fairly obvious one there's the the hedgehog always a good one to find and this one is this is the classic for the uh, uh the wet grassland wader warden and this is fox that you'll be looking out for finally this is the the one poo that I've only got in photograph form, it's quite difficult to collect um, because this particular animal poos in the water and then spins it around to spread it all out. So the only way you can actually collect it is in this form. And of course, this one, hippopotamus. And that's it. There's a brief trot through my poo collection. Uh, I hope you found that interesting. Thank you very much.